Well, thank you so much for this invitation to speak, and I was so delighted to get an invitation to be on the same stage with two of my favorite women in the whole world. Um, when we were at dinner tonight, Seal was saying that uh, wherever the U.S. is about to bomb, Kathy Kelly goes there first. <laughs> and I've seen her in all of these places. And then Anne will tell you her amazing story, but um, Anne is just like, I would go anywhere in the world where Anne was going just to be with Anne. So to be on the stage is a great honor to me. And I wanted to invoke another friend of ours who's not here because when I think of international women, uh, Ray, you said, pull a Medea. And what he's referring to is I do things like get up when the president is speaking and ask him some questions in the middle of his talk, or we go into the halls of Congress, and instead of being sitting there very nicely, we kind of get up and say, uh, we, the people, have some questions we want to ask. And one of our good friends is Diane Wilson, who wrote a book called Unreasonable Women, because she said that uh, reasonable women do not make history. And I think it's important tonight to pay tribute to those unreasonable women. And because it is now the anniversary of 11 years of the invasion of Iraq, uh, I remember Diane Wilson and I and a bunch of us from Code Pink and others going to the United Nations to try to say, please, UN, do something. We had just returned from Iraq. We had been with the weapons inspectors. We knew there were no weapons of mass destruction, and we were saying that uh, the weapons inspectors also said that, and uh, no reason to go to war. And Diane Wilson climbed up on the uh, fence of the UN with a big sign saying to the UN, you know, stop a war in Iraq. And the police came over and said, come on, you know, you've, you've made your point, you've made your point. She said, no, I'm going to come over, you've made your point. And finally said, come on, sweetheart, you've made your point. And she said, I have not made my point, and I am not a sweetheart. <laughs> So sometimes you got to be a little unreasonable in a world that is so unreasonable. And I started my work around uh, these issues of war and peace when I was in high school, and uh, my country took us into a war in Vietnam. And let's see if there are any people here who are veterans from Vietnam. You want to raise your hands? So uh, right, some of you stand. here, um, uh, you know, when there was a draft, it was very hard not to get involved because our brothers were being drafted, our uh, boyfriends were being drafted, and the whole country was really part of uh, a discussion around this war, and there was a whole youth movement because there was a draft. And you fast forward today, and it's very hard because with a volunteer army and less than 1% of the people having any direct relationship with the military, um, it's very tough to get people to understand how much these wars are affecting their lives. And also, with the switch from the boots on the ground, with the hundreds of thousands of people we've had in Afghanistan and, and Iraq, to now a new kind of war, which is special operations, commando raids, and drones, uh, people hardly even know where we are at war. And that's why I wrote this book on drone warfare, because I was seeing how it was a way of keeping the U.S. involved in a perpetual state of war without the American people even knowing or realizing. And the little that we've been told by our government was that this is such an effective way of fighting war because it keeps our folks safe. They are operating these drones from here in the United States on bases in, uh, in air-conditioned rooms and ergonomic chairs. They're not putting their lives at risk, but they're killing people thousands of miles away in places they probably have never been to. And we, when we talk about civil rights, let's think about the civil rights of people in these countries where we are targeting people because just because we might have a suspicion that they might be terrorists. And let's remember that these are all people of color, and these are all poor people. And when we look at the thousands of people that have been killed by our drones in places where we are at war, like Afghanistan, or places where we're not at war, like Pakistan, Yemen, and Somalia, our president is playing the role of prosecutor, judge, jury, executioner, uh, killing people without giving them a chance to surrender, and certainly without giving them a chance to a trial. And when we're told that, well, this is effective, um, we have to look at, well, is Al-Qaeda been eliminated? 
have the Taliban been eliminated? Not at all. We're into 12 years of war. Uh, we have depleted trillions of dollars of our economy that has contributed to the economic crisis that we're still in. We've killed uh, untold numbers of people in these countries, and by drones alone, perhaps as Lindsey Graham once blurted out, because our government doesn't tell us these figures, he said, well, maybe about 4,500 people. Uh, and Al-Qaeda is bigger than it was before. And we see it spreading from not just Afghanistan, but to Pakistan, and then Yemen, and to Somalia, to Northern Africa, and now in places like Syria and Iraq, where there never was Al-Qaeda before we invaded Iraq. So uh, we also are told that very few innocent people are killed. And a lot of what I have been doing uh, over the last couple of years with my colleagues like Anne Wright have been going to the places where we're using these drones and talking to people and meeting the family members of innocent people who have been killed by our drones and coming back and telling their stories here in the United States, writing in the book and trying to get people to understand that we are killing lots of innocent people and we are making lots of enemies that these drones have become the best recruiting tool for Al-Qaeda. On the positive side of all of this, um, we are seeing just in the last couple of years a real turnaround, one in public opinion. Uh, when I, I, There was a poll that was taken in February of 2012 that said that 83% of Americans thought it was okay to use drones to kill terrorist suspects. That means somebody who's never been convicted of anything. That included a majority of Republicans, Democrats, Independents, and a majority of men and women. And when we look at women's roles in this, women are usually less likely to want to use violence, more likely to look for other means like non-violent uh, uh, negotiations. And yet, after 9-11, that switched, and women were in favor of going to war in Afghanistan. Well, I'm happy to say that the last poll that was taken said only 60% of Americans, still way too many, still a majority, but when it was broken down by gender, a majority of women were no longer in favor of using drones to kill terrorist suspects overseas. So that is progress. Um, I want to um, say a couple of other things that we have achieved so far. And that is uh, forcing our government to talk about a program that was so covert that they wouldn't even admit, admit that the CIA was in charge of this program, the secretive part of the military, the Joint Special Operations Command. So our government has been embarrassed by the protests that have been going on at home and overseas. We have folks who are out in front of the bases where the drones are being operated. Uh, both Ann and Kathy Kelly have been arrested at, at, at these, as have numerous people who have been going in what we call a Gandhian wave over and over again to get arrested and to use the trials as a way to educate the public and try to get the media interested in talking about these issues. We have teamed up with people who have been protesting in places like Pakistan and Yemen where the drones are being used. We've worked with our European allies. In fact, the European Union just in February overwhelmingly passed a resolution saying that targeted assassinations with these drones should be considered illegal and no European nation should participate in this. We have helped to get this issue brought up now at the United Nations and a beginning of a change of policy is that at least in the case of Pakistan, there have been far fewer drone attacks uh, in this last year uh, than there were in previous years. We haven't finished. We want to keep working until we stop the drone attacks and stop the global proliferation of drones. But we're moving in that direction. And as a sense of where the country is now, it is quite remarkable to see that after 9-11, when there was so much gung-ho, yeah, let's go get them, and who was them? Wasn't necessarily people who were involved in attacking us in 9-11. It was used as an excuse to go into places like Iraq that had nothing to do with 9-11. Well, the mood of the country has changed dramatically, and that is a very positive thing to see. We saw it when the president gave his red line and he said uh, that he was going to bring us into a military engagement in the case of Syria uh, uh, and uh, the American people from left to right, Democrats, Republicans, Libertarians said, wait a minute, I don't think this is good for the United States. 
Uh, there's a lot of talk in the media about war wariness from the American public, and that is certainly true, but I think it's something else, and that's a war wiseness which is that Americans understand that even if we want to do something to help people, like in the case of Syria, and certainly we want to do something to stop the terrible suffering there, the U.S. military involvement is not the answer. And we're seeing that in the case of Iran right now, where one of the strongest lobby groups in the United States called AIPAC, which is, is the lobby group that has been taking the side of the very right-wing uh, Israeli government and used to brag that they could get uh, a majority, 80 senators, to sign on to anything they wanted, um, got stuck this time when they wanted to pass a legislation that would go against the president's attempts to find a negotiated solution with Iran. And they couldn't get the majority of senators to agree with that because the American public doesn't want to see us get involved in another war like a war with Iran. And in, this, in the issue of Ukraine that is uh, so hot in the news right now, there was a poll taken that showed that 56% uh, of American, percentage of American people as compared to 29% said that the U.S. should not get too involved in the issue of Ukraine because once again, the American people understand that we have so many problems here at home we have to take care of and that our money should go into what Martin Luther King described as life-affirming activities, not to more death-making. And so I think as we talk about the future of the peace movement, while it's been difficult under a Democratic president, Barack Obama, to build a broad-based peace movement that gets out on the streets, like we could do under the Bush administration, we do actually have a broad-based peace movement that spans the ideological spectrum, that does understand that U.S. military intervention is not going to help people overseas, is going to make us more hated and less secure at home, and that I think this is the time that we hook up with groups that are the victims now of the uh, budget cuts and try to build the kind of coalitions that we're seeing going on in places like North Carolina, places like Georgia, where these different groups that have been working in isolation are now coming together. And I think as we come together, let's say, one of the things we want to do is cut that military bloated budget and put it into life-affirming activities. Thank you.